Hello, everybody. Um, and we're going to, of course, be talking about diplomacy um, and whether or not, in particular, in, in light of, of Russia's war on Ukraine, this signals a turn towards a new form of diplomacy or whether or not it signals the end of diplomacy um, as we know it. Of course, it can't be the end of, of diplomacy. Let me um, give way to, to the fellows and, and uh, sorry, to the experts and to introduce them. Um, I'll start with Sergei Radchenko, provided that he, I think he's, yes, he, he's managed to um, reconnect. And even if he hasn't, it's still nice to, to introduce him. It, it will add to the anticipation. Um, Sergei Radchenko is the, the Wilson E. Schmidt um, Distinguished Professor at the John Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies. He's written extensively on the Cold War, nuclear history, and on Russian and Chinese foreign and security policies. Um, he's just finished, I believe, although he keeps on updating whether or not he's finished it, um, a, a very large, um, a very hefty sounding book on, on the Cold War. And he served as a, as a global fellow and a public policy fellow at the, at the Woodrow Wilson Center and the Zizhang Distinct and as the Zizhang Distinguished Professor at East China Normal University. We're also lucky, very lucky and fortunate to be joined by Olga Olika, who's the Programme Director for Europe and Central Asia International Crisis Group um, in Brussels, and where she leads the organization's research analysis, policy prescription and advocacy in and about Russia, Europe, Turkey, Caucasus and Central Asia. Um, Olga's own research interests center on the foreign and security policies of, of Russia, Ukraine, and the Central Asian and Caucasian successor states to the Soviet Union, domestic politics in these countries, US policy towards the region, and nuclear weapon strategy and arms control. And of course, um, Dr. Robert Legvold, who's um, really um, quite the, the he essentially is, I suppose, if we had a professor, of course, he's a professor emeritus at Columbia, but if we had a professor emeritus, I think for, for the uh, Monterey Symposium, certainly that, that role, that role of honour would go to um, Professor Legwold, um, who has been with us um, from the very, very beginning, um, before I was with us, before. <laughs> so um, it's an unusual phrase for me to say. Um, and he will, as always, as is tradition, um, have, have the last words um, in towards the end of the panel so that um, we continue our pattern of him always having the last um, communication with the fellows. But first, let me introduce him properly. So Robert Legvold is Marshall D. Shulman Professor Emeritus in the Department of Political Science at Columbia University, where he specialized in the international relations of the post-Soviet states. He was director of the Harriman Institute, which does not need any introduction to, to you, from 1986 to 1992. And his areas of particular interest are the foreign policies of Russia, Ukraine, and the other states um, of the former Soviet Union, US relations with these states, and the impact um, of the post-Soviet region on the international politics of, of Asia and Europe. So thank you all to our three distinguished experts for, for joining us. We're going to now start the, um, the general discussion. And I would like to start actually very quickly um, with just a very quick question, which is by asking each of our speakers in turn to explain briefly, just 60, 90 seconds, whether or not you believe that diplomacy, um, both between the collective West or, or the US, led mainly by the USA and Russia is possible, but also whether or not diplomacy between Ukraine and Russia is, is, is possible right now. Um, Olga, I, would you mind if I start with you, please? Um, not at all. Uh, thanks for having me. So is diplomacy possible? Of course it is, right? Uh, it just isn't easy as witness uh, Lavrov um, blowing off uh, Blinken. I mean, that's in a way, it's a form of diplomacy. All of this messaging, all of the posturing, all of the signaling is diplomacy, right? Um, and I think, so I think the question is less, uh, you know, whether diplomacy is possible, it's how successful it can be and at what times and to what ends. Uh, and I think that's something we'll be discussing, I guess, uh, in the balance of this conversation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Olga. It's a, um, a correctly expansive definition of, of diplomacy, much better than I, than I use. Um, um, uh, Bob, would would you care to, to follow up on this, whether or not you think that there can be um, maybe I'll start with there can be successful diplomacy uh, between Russia and the West and between Russia and Ukraine at this moment. Well, I certainly agree with Olya's definition of diplomacy as broader than uh, than negotiation and direct engagement for 
uh, pursuit of uh, an agreement uh, as sort of a framework for the uh, for the for my comments, my coming comments. I think about this issue at three levels. First of all, what might be called the sphere of diplomacy, uh, and in that context, in the Ukrainian war, uh, above the Ukrainian war, uh, and beyond the Ukrainian war. Secondly, in terms of the parties, you've already laid that out, Jade, between Russia and the West uh, and between Russia, between Moscow and Kiev. But then a third context that I have thoughts about, and that is the diplomatic context, broader diplomatic context for discussing diplomacy in the con- uh, uh, with respect to the Ukrainian war. That is, what other diplomatic fronts with what other parties matters to the prospects of diplomacy and what we're talking about today. One um, wonderful sort of problematizing definition, I think, that sets us up well for, for the coming panel. Thank, thank you very much, Bob. And Sergey, please, could I ask the same question to you? Completely agree that diplomacy is uh, possible, it's desirable, it's inevitable. Uh, we, we have to have diplomacy or diplomatic exit from any conf- conflict, and eventually we will have. The question is what sort of diplomacy, what sort of diplomatic efforts can be undertaken. Actually, a lot of diplomacy is taking place, just we don't know about it. A lot of it is happening behind the scenes. There's a lot of public diplomacy that is happening at the same time. And we need to talk about perhaps the kind of messages that we project with our public diplomacy. Uh, uh, but uh, yes, absolutely, I agree with uh, with uh, what um, uh, both uh, Rob and Olya said. Wonderful. That I feel like that's a useful start. So at least at least we know there's something to discuss on, on the panel. Uh, it's helpful, helpful for me. Um, I would like now to ask each of you, perhaps in the order that we we just had to present um, your views on how, and so I guess just started to talk about that really, but on how Russia's uh, war on Ukraine will change um, diplomacy and, and diplomatic practices between Russia and the West in particular, but also maybe around, around the globe and, and feel free to approach this very large and unwieldy question um, as, 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 you, as you see fit or as you prefer. Um, Olga, please, could I um, start with your opening, your opening comment? Sure. Um, so I want to start off by saying that um, it's uh, it's difficult to proceed, Bob and Sergey, because I'm quite confident they're going to say really interesting things. Um, so I will see if I can throw some of my own ideas about these questions out here with kind of this caveat that I'm not a specialist in diplomacy or diplomatic history. And for me, diplomacy, whether defined broadly or more narrowly, uh, is one of many tools countries have at their disposal, so I tend to look at it within that context. But having said that, I'm going to begin with two quotes, uh, both of them coming from diplomats that I've talked to comparatively recently here in Brussels. And the first, um, and this one's coming from a diplomat from a Western European country, which I shall not name, and it's this. I'm pretty sure that my job is at least sometimes to talk to evil people. And then the second, which is coming from a diplomat from a former Soviet country, which I won't name, is one thing we've learned is that to prevent conflict, you have to offer concessions. So I think these two quotes are really pretty good encapsulations of what diplomacy is about. Uh, It's about how you engage your adversary, and it's about figuring out uh, sometimes what it is you're willing to give up in order to get what you want uh, from those adversaries and sometimes from your friends, but even friendly relations uh, can be adversarial in diplomatic contexts. And you're not going to get very far with diplomacy if, uh, for instance, let's say there's a war and the warring parties are uninterested in either engaging or making concessions or they're unable to engage or offer concessions. So in the debate that we're hearing, that we're having now with regard to Ukraine, I think there's a certain tendency uh, amongst some some, uh, participants to reject diplomacy. And I think there's a opposite tendency uh, among others to fetishize it a little bit. So there are a number of reasons to reject diplomacy and to refuse to talk, uh, you know, kind of to refuse to talk face to face, uh, even if you are signaling and you're doing the public diplomacy and so forth. So one of those is um, that of all the items, uh, of all the tools of national power in the toolkits uh, available to countries, uh, 
both the United States and Russia have tended uh, increasingly over recent years to discount diplomacy in favor of military power. Um, and I don't even mean coercive diplomacy, right, where you're saying that I want to threaten force, but really what I want to do is get a deal, though we've seen some of that. It's this tendency to not try very hard to find a deal, but instead to try to accomplish whatever you're going to accomplish by military means. So why is that? Um, and, you know, we can unpack this if we want to. From the U.S. perspective, I think it stems in part from the ease of use presented by military power and then the circular pattern in which the more you use force, the stronger bureaucratically uh, the Pentagon gets, the more you see military solutions to problems because these are the people who are making the decisions. And there are obviously other reasons for the United States, and many of you may have good ideas on those. I mean, I think hegemonic overreach, uh, gender, you know, there's just, there's a whole, uh, um, there, there, there's a rainbow um, of flavors here. Uh, and for the Russian perspective, there's also um, a similar rainbow. But I would point out that force has been comparatively effective for Moscow and until recently, um, not very costly. So Russia, what Russia has tried to use diplomacy, economic coercion, soft power, other tools, they haven't gotten what they wanted. Uh, when they've used force, they don't always get everything they want. But if you look at Georgia, if you look at Crimea, if you look at Ukraine in 2014, at least at the start of the war, if you look at Syria, you get you seem to get more, um, more bang for your buck, at least up until quite recently. So it's also um, it's become a statement of credibility and anchoring for Russia to use force in a way it's not for the United States. And it's helped Russia punch above its weight. Right. Russia goes into a conflict and it puts its military there and then it's taken seriously in a way that its other tools just can't get it, um, it can't get it that kind of weight. Uh, but then the reliance on force and the decisions that made this reliance possible, I think, were also driven by worldview on the part of the Putin government, the people around Vladimir Putin, which have a tendency to favor violent solutions more generally at home as well as abroad, right, when we look at responses to protests and so forth. And here, I think, for instance, gender views that link um, mil the military to the masculine and then put all that together into a desire to be masculine, a um, you know privileging of uh, masculinity. And I think that also contributes. Uh, for other countries, which perhaps would like to use other tools, they end up caught in the system that favors military solutions and doesn't give them a ton of space. So coming back to the war in Ukraine right now, diplomacy had a lot of fans in the lead up to Russia's invasion in February, right? There was a real effort by Western states to avert the war with diplomacy. And what I think is really interesting is if you talk to people in the Russian Ministry of Foreign Affairs, a lot of them will tell you they thought that it was what its government was doing too, that they were, used, that they were trying an approach of coercive diplomacy diplomacy, that the military forces weren't going to be used, and that diplomacy was going to be given a chance. But that's not what happened. And diplomacy did not prevent the war. And, you know, maybe it could have, perhaps by delivering clear deterrence signals from Western states, maybe not. But this is where we are. So then we get to the next question of, can diplomacy end this war? And this, I think, is where we get to some of the fetishization. So, you know, in the lead up to the war, we heard all of these discussions about what sort of a deal would prevent the war. And now we're hearing a lot of arguments about what sort of a deal would end the war. Now, the thing is, there may have been deals that would have prevented this war. There are probably deals that would end it right now. But I can pretty much guarantee you these are not going to be the deals that actually end the war. Because anytime there's a deal that ends a conflict, despite this tendency to think that, okay, so that's the solution, that is the answer to the equation, uh, you know, if only we had come to this earlier, but that's not how this works. It's not possible earlier. It's not that the geniuses have finally solved for the for the answer. Uh, it's that the fighting has reached the point that this specific deal was seen by all relevant parties as better than continuing to fight. And that's a very different thing. than this is what you can get at any point in time. And you just have to negotiate until you get there. So all these things like various models of Ukrainian neutrality, different types of security guarantees, different territorial lines, they might be in a deal signed at the end of this war. But none of them are feasible now because Ukraine and Russia remain committed to giving war a chance. Why do they think war is better than peace? 
because the warring parties, uh, Ukraine and Russia, and Ukraine's backers in the West, uh, who are making Ukraine's continuing fight possible, have incompatible aims, and their willingness to compromise is so limited as to have no real uh, no real overlap when it comes to a settlement. Uh, for Ukraine, that's because it feels giving up territory will embolden Russia, which will then take more territory sooner or later. Uh, for Russia, it's because it wants Ukraine to be a vassal state and the West and everyone else to recognize its sovereignty over it, and ideally Moldova, Belarus, and Georgia too. And for Western states, because they're pretty confident that if Russia comes out of Ukraine victorious uh, by whatever definition, uh, it will do this again in Ukraine or elsewhere, and that's going to bring greater escalatory risks. So the only way to mitigate those risks is to weaken Russia as much as possible uh, and defeat it as much as possible before any deal is struck. So, you know, they're willing to have a deal, but they want to deal with Russia on the back foot. So I think the challenge, the, the issue here is that you're not going to diplomacy away Russia's ambitions, the West's view of them as dangerous, or Ukraine's desire for sovereignty. That doesn't mean diplomacy is useless. Um, it's actually mitigating the damage even as we speak. Prisoner exchanges, exchanges of remains, the grain deal, which was, you know, in many ways a triumph of diplomacy. Um, there are other efforts that have failed, but what I think is interesting is these failures also, they give us a sense of how people are looking at this. Um, it helps. It helps us to communicate things that could help end the war, right? Uh, limitations on aims, right? The United States makes very clear that it's not going to um, pursue regime change. Until the spring, both Russia and Ukraine had delegations that were actually talking. Russia's was arguably not serious, not at the right level, messages at cross purposes with the Kremlin, but it did get us pretty clear statements of what preferences were, uh, which I think is helpful. And then the other thing, which maybe we can discuss in Q&A, because I don't want to take up more time uh, than is allocated, which is the diplomacy that continues on other files, Karabakh, Central African Republic. Um, uh, the Un United States has signaled very clearly that it's interested in returning to the arms control table. And I really think that if you do want to avoid later escalations, it's going to be arms control that has to be the way forward for that. So, you know, kind of, it's a question of what you expect of diplomacy. Um, the, uh, but I think it really it has an inescapable future. Um, and I'll close there. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Olga. That's very helpful. Um, lens is particularly interesting, actually, to, to think about the, the gendered lens, maybe especially in light of, of, of some more recent developments in the war. Um, Robert, um, Bob, sorry, please, could I pass over to you to hear your opening remarks? Well, first, let me say that uh, um, what uh, Olya has just said is very smart, it's very wise, uh, and obviously very lucid. So keep that very much in mind uh, when you listen to my much cruder and much grimmer assessment of where things stand right now. And uh, that will also be softened, I think, by Sergei. I know his work before. He'll have a more positive view of what may be possible in the circumstances. Uh, and I interrupt myself to say, uh, uh, Jade has said that I've been a part of the symposium for a long time. That's true. This is the second year when I haven't been able to be with you. Uh, and that changes the uh, relationship very considerably, as I know from the earlier occasions when I could. Uh, but I have looked at all of your uh, bios, so I know you at least as the, as, uh, as the symposium presents you. Uh, let me start by saying uh, in a way that uh, is, as I've said, crude, uh, and uh, it probably somewhere along the line is going to change further. But my basic judgment right now is that this war, whenever and however uh, it proceeds, is not going to end with an agreed resolution. I, instead, I think what we're going to see is one of two outcomes, with either more or less Ukrainian territory seized and then absorbed by Russia, unrecognized by either Kiev or by the West, or alternatively, a Korean-like uh, stalemate. Uh, and what will be left at that point is essentially Ukraine that is lost to Russia, Ukraine that is a security ward of uh, NATO and the West in whatever form it is at that point, uh, may be well on the path toward EU membership. Uh, the NATO alliance will be cheek by jowl to 
a Russia military that will remain formidable on a central front from the Black Sea to the Arctic, with now an 830-mile extension along the Finnish border. Uh, and in that context, uh, the first of the levels that I was talking about in terms of diplomacy, that is diplomacy seen as direct engagement and negotiation uh, with, the, uh, with some kind of an objective, positive objective in mind, I think, uh, will be of different sorts. Uh, in, within the dimension of in, that is in the Ukrainian war, both uh, between Moscow and Kiev, I think the terrain is non-existent uh, for the reasons that Olya has said and that many of you know from other commentators that you've had along the way. Uh, the scope of it, that is, uh, the particular items that can be included in it will continue to be there, whether it's things like the grain deal or prisoner exchanges or maybe even humanitarian assistance. But in terms of ending the war, I think that will be an empty box. And the will to engage bilaterally Moscow-Ukraine is going to be missing entirely, again, for the reasons that Olya laid out, I think, very well. Uh, between uh, the United States uh, and the extended West, the collective West as the Russia sees it, and Russia, in the war, again, I think it's precisely as Olya said, although she didn't stress the fact that for the time being, the United States, I think, having the lead uh, doesn't want to get out front of and is not willing to get out front of Kiev and its approach to negotiations uh, and active diplomacy, if you will. And I think that will remain until circumstances change enough so the United States is rethinking what kind of initiative it wants to uh, exert. And in the meantime, the Ukrainians will be wrestling with that question as well. But on the above the Ukrainian war, I think there is an area, uh, all you referred to arms control, but as I said to you yesterday, October of this year will be the 60th anniversary of the Cuban Missile Crisis. Uh, the United States and Russia will still have 90% of the nuclear weapons, and in a deepening and hardening and increasingly dangerous Cold War between Russia, the West, and the United States, it's all the more important that they return to what they had begun after the Geneva Summit in 2021, the Strategic Stability Dialogue, and the two working groups that were quite appropriate for what one needs to be wrestling with at this point. Uh, and I would not rule out the possibility, it would require some considerable change in Washington and in Moscow, that at some point, even if this war continues for more than a year or so, that somewhere along the line, given the time frame for the extended new start, that they would uh, address that that uh, that critical issue, and in this context, beyond the Ukrainian war, in terms of the Russia and the uh, and the West, uh, at some point, if it ends as I've described it, and that's the reason I started with my crude and grim prognosis of what I think will be in the future. That will mean these forces, uh, and and in in each case, they'll be they'll be boosted. You already see what NATO is planning as a result of Madrid summit. Uh, by way of reconfiguration and enhancement uh, and redeployment. Uh, there will be a need, I think, if people are sensible, to return to the guardrails that they dismantled over what I call the years of the Cold War since 2014. Uh, that is some way of regulating forces deployed for forward equipment, uh, what was done by way of transparency and monitoring in a uh, refurbished or rejuvenated open skies deal, deal the Vienna uh, adapted treaty, and maybe even the moratorium that was part of that diplomacy that Olya referred to in December of a moratorium on deployment, as I say, moratorium on deployment of intermediate range ballistic missiles. Uh, when it comes to that other category, I finish with this, of other diplomatic contexts that matter directly in terms of the war. Remember early on, uh, there was a more active role by both Turkey and Israel, and then question marks about what role China would play in terms of the conduct of the war or the ending of the war. Uh, and each of those parties uh, who had different levels of credibility in Kiev versus credibility within Moscow uh, 
uh, uh, had the potential of playing something of a role, and Turkey has had a significant role in the in the in the grain deal, as you know. Uh, it's generally believed that the Chinese won't play a role in this until, as Kevin Rudd puts it, five minutes to the hour when they realize that uh, Putin's uh, gambit has has failed, or that there is some urgent reason for China. Uh, to to uh, to uh, uh, to push the diplomacy of it, but I think about it in a broader context. Uh, yesterday, I said to you that my apprehension, what I would like major leaders to be focused on, is the risk of a U.S.-China relationship that actually slides or stumbles into a full-scale Cold War, and then links with the U.S.-Russia Cold War and the bipolar world that that will create. Uh, in that context. Uh, that is the effort uh, b- uh, to prevent that from happening. If the United States and China begin to adjust diplomacy between themselves, that will have an implication for what happens to diplomacy in the context of the war uh, within the broader context of the deepening Russia-West Cold War. Uh, I, I'm, I, I don't want to take more time now at the beginning, but that's a subject that I'd be prepared to discuss for you in, in greater detail. That is the diplomatic context in the largest sense of the U.S.-China relationship and the risk of Cold War uh, and its implications for the U.S.-Russia Cold War with the Ukrainian component as part of it, I think is a, I think is a critical question. I don't think we've begun to think about it. Thank you very much, Bob. I have no doubt that we'll come back to, to that important aspect um, throughout the Q&A. Um, Sergey, um, please, may I hand over to you now? Thank you. Very difficult to go after such fun presentations. Um, I will. I, I don't. I don't have much optimism on the score, um, despite what Bob said. That I, you know, maybe I should have some optimism, but you know, I don't. I think. You are lost hope. <laughs> okay, okay. You know, well, you know, you know. Of course, the 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 Soviet joke about you know the opt optimist optimist the difference between optimist and pessimist. That the pessimist says it can get worse, and optimist says the yes, it still can. So in the you know, in this sense, I I I can be an optimist. But um, uh, where to start here? Uh, there is no end in sight to this conflict at the moment. Uh, I agree with what Bob said about the likely um, uh, scenarios. Uh, Korean War, of course, has long been the most likely scenario uh, for for uh, where this is going. Um, there are grim prospects here because if, it, as what's increasingly likely, you know, Russia is going to hold on to the territory that it currently controls and is probably going to annex that territory. It's going to be very difficult then to to push Russia out from this territory. In fact, the longer the Russians stay there, um, the more there's an opportunity to create new structures mm-hmm. of power, structures of authority, uh, which, when then it becomes much more difficult to basically push the Russians out. We've seen this in Crimea and uh, Eastern Ukraine is also uh, uh, heading in, in that direction. In addition, Russia is going to be uh, able to sabotage Ukraine's economic recovery by launching missiles, for example, directed at Ukrainian infrastructure. Uh, although we have been talking here in the West about potentially you know, a Marshall Plan or something like that for Ukraine. I am a little bit pessimistic about it. In particular, I'm pessimistic about the prospect of private companies going into Ukraine to participate in Ukraine's economic recovery. Why is this simply there is an ongoing conflict it's go it's 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 very difficult to plan anything when a russian missile randomly launched from moscow is you know going to destroy take out an airport or in critical point of infrastructure so therefore there is no easy this prospect here for Ukraine's economic recovery, um, the war is likely to continue. And it's going to be, by the way, very difficult because the Russians are digging in in the territory that they already control. It's going to be very, very difficult to push them out from there. So I, I would agree with Bob that the most likely outcome is the Korean War kind of scenario where both sides are just, just cannot go on. They are tired. And then you've got some sort of a ceasefire. Um, and of course, in the Korean case, you remember that actually the, the two parties reached that point by 
uh, April 1951, approximately. And then it took two further years before you could actually have an armistice on the ground, as it were, because each party thought that they might make gains. Um, and, and there were other problems that inter- that that, that um, created, uh, created obstacles in the way of um, some sort of a ceasefire. So in the end, we had an agreement in Korea, it took two years to achieve. And of course, this, this agreement has uh, been holding ever since. And the temporary, what seemed like a temporary division, in fact, became permanent, a permanent division. So uh, you know, the, as the French say, the temporary is the one, it's the only thing that lasts. And, and, and that is probably the most likely, it has been for some time, the most likely outcome of the Ukrainian conflict. In addition, there are other factors to consider here. There's a war fatigue in the West. Uh, it has been, it's an, it's not unexpected and people's attention span is limited. There's so much that we can, uh, that, uh, that, that we can spend in terms of our emotional energy and our attention on the war in Ukraine. It's been going on for months and months and months. And uh, we've got problems of our own. We have an economic crisis. We have an energy crisis in Europe. We have inflation that uh, has been unseen for 40 years in European, in the European Union. Uh, and uh, in, in increasingly also in the United States. And that leads to all kinds of issues uh, domestically in terms of the rise of populism. Uh, we have seen that in the recent French elections. Um, and all of that is reassuring for Putin. I mean, this is what Putin is counting on. He's hoping for the West to basically get tired of this war. Um, in the short term, we, we're not going to see this translate into less, into less support for Ukraine because there's a for example, in the United States, a bipartisan, bipartisan consensus where the even if the Democrats, let's say, lose the uh, midterms, some sort of military support for Ukraine is likely to continue for the foreseeable future. However, uh, there are already voices, of course, in the West who are saying, you know, it's a, it, it costs us five to seven billion dollars a month to sustain this war in Ukraine while our own societies are you know undergoing economic crisis is it worth it for us and Putin is saying no it's not worth it for you so therefore you know he's counting on basically outweighing the West here um Russia is not as isolated as we we'll, we want we hoped that it would be we were quite optimistic early on in this war that look you know all the, all the companies are fleeing Russia, it's everything is coming apart, etc. But it turned out that a, for example, Russian economic, you know, economic situation, despite the recent paper that you would, you would maybe some of you would have seen, uh, actually, maybe we will have a chance to talk about this paper. I don't agree with some of the findings there, but the Russian economy has been able um, to uh, has shown some resilience in the face of this, uh, of 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 what uh, by all uh, by all means is a, is a very you know serious. Um, uh, uh ex- exodus of western companies also in terms of russia's uh, relationship with the global south you know much of the global south frankly doesn't care they don't care they think that this is this war some kind of a uh just uh, s- some war between great powers in the far removed corner of their mental maps uh, they care about food security, of course, but they tend to blame the West as much as they blame Russia. Uh, and of course, China remains an important lifeline, although we'll talk more about China, I'm sure. In other words, uh, there, there are positive factors, there are negative factors here, uh, but what's very likely is that this war will continue for a very, very long time and it will fizzle out eventually in some sort of Korean-style uh, scenario. What under these circumstances should the West do? And this is where we circle back to this question of diplomacy. What I think we need to think about in the West is having a long-term strategy with regard to Russia. I see our strategy being very short-term, focused on the next week or the next two weeks or at most couple of months. So just let's see how the Ukrainians do on the ground. Maybe they'll be able to take back Kherson. Everything will change from there, etc. We don't think long-term. If we come around to considering that actually this is a very protracted conflict and may like you know may last for for years then we need to think beyond that 
and think about how what to make what sort of diplomacy we need in order to make something out you know out of this relationship between Russia and the West. I mean that would I would uh, um, echo some of the things that Bob was saying about the need. First of all, the most important thing, the need to avoid escalation. This remains our number one priority in the West. I know the war in Ukraine is a horrible thing, and atrocities are being committed by the Russians on a daily basis. But we also need to remember that it could get much worse. Uh, it could still escalate. There Therefore, we need to think about how to avoid escalation. And uh, I think so far, NATO and the United States have played it very wisely, very well, you know, very smartly with regard to Ukraine in terms of, for example, not heeding to Kiev's call for um, uh, for the no fly establishing a no fly zone that would be controlled by or patrolled by NATO, et cetera, or providing direct involvement or the direct support by NATO troops. Of course, I would think that the escalation risks are just too much there. Now, the good news here, the good news, and, and this is actually quite different from, let's say, the Cuban Missile Crisis in 1962 uh, that Bob has referred to. Uh, today, the, the, the Russians and the Americans know much more about each other, their respect Respective nuclear arsenals. There's much greater strategic stability because the arsenals are based around, you know, the, the triads are um, much more invulnerable compared to the Cuban Missile Crisis. And, um, and there's there uh, we know about each other's command and control procedures and so on. So there's some kind of reserve of confidence in this regard and an understanding about how to avoid escalatory steps. So uh, and this at least makes me a little bit optimistic in general. Um, second point that, that we need to worry about, as it were, uh, in the West, we do not need to destabilize Russia. There's been a lot of talk about this, you know, decolonize Russia, break it up into pieces, et cetera, et cetera. This is insane. All of this is utterly insane. Um, uh, President Bush Sr., of course, notably, was very much against this, the breakup of the Soviet Union for that very reason, because the moment you have a major superpower that is, that is full of nuclear weapons break into pieces. What's going to happen at this point? Nobody can predict. I mean, we were lucky in 1991. We cannot ho hope to be lucky again. Uh, uh, so I don't, I don't see. And there are also all kinds of other reasons why I don't think that breaking up Russia into constituent pieces is a very good idea at all. Um, we should not imagine that Russia is going to become a democracy. Okay, this is okay. Here I will just uh, echo some of the things that Stephen Kotkin said in his uh, fairly well-known New York New Yorker mm -hmm. interview. But basically, we shouldn't rule it out. You know, it, it could happen, but 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 it 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 doesn't seem likely. So we should learn to live with the fact that Russia is going to be a hideous autocratic country for a long time for for uh, for for the foreseeable future, as it were. Uh, and 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 we should not try to uh, um, change that. You know, Russia is for the Russians to change if they come around to that. And who knows when it's going to happen? Maybe it's not. It's never going going to happen. Perhaps, but we still need to share the planet. I mean, even Khrushchev and Kennedy understood that back in the 1960s. We should be able to understand that today. Um, uh, final point: messaging is very very important, and this is where we. Talk, we can talk about a little bit about public diplomacy. What sort of message we send to the Russians, even over the head of their government? Um, uh, the I, the message that we should send, I think, is that the West is interested in seeing a strong independent, non-aligned Russia that is not a supplicant to China, that is not a vassal of China of some 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 sort. As long, you know, the West has a problem, not with Russia per se, but with the aggressive policy of Russia and the fact that Russia is invading a neighboring country. That is the message that should be projected over, over the heads of the Russian government, over to the Russian people. And that is very important because one day, I think the Russian strategic community, I think many, many people there, by the way, fully realize that. It's just they cannot contradict the system. But many people realize that it is in the Russian national interest to actually steer uh, some sort of a midway between the West and China and not fall into the trap, not fall into China's arms, because China is going to be able to exercise increasing leverage over Russia. And it's not good for Russia at all. Russia, you know, it's not, it doesn't benefit Russia's interest. So in the long term, we can hope that Russians will see that, as of course they should, and they're seeing this, they're beginning to see this now. And perhaps 
find a more reasonable policy, less belligerent policy towards the West, um, uh, um, something like a non-aligned policy. And in this context, it's very important to maintain people-to-people -people contact, i.e., uh, make sure that we don't ban all the Russians. You know, some people are calling to ban the Russians from the West or not allow them or something like that. No, we should actually have more contacts with the Russians, certainly at the academic level, uh, at the academic level or students, for example, and and the benefit of that are obvious. People who will you know, who come to the West, they will see the West and they will understand that the propaganda that is, being, is being fed to them by their government is manifestly untrue. They will go back or maybe they will not go back and they'll stay. And if they're professionals, if they're smart people, we will undermine Putin's regime by taking by breeding the talent or a talent over here. So uh, all of all, you know, all of those things, I think, should be done as a long term strategy. It's not a question of a week, not a question of two weeks or a month. It's a question of years and years and years, perhaps decades. And I'll stop here. Thank you, Sergei. I think um, there's so many wonderful points there. And I think in particular, I'll just pick up quickly on the last point, because clearly with, through the symposium, we're trying to keep people to people contacts as well. And that's something very close. And, and I think just to, I, I imagine I, I can speak here as well on our director on um, Anna Vrusevna's part, that the idea of having some sort of anti or reverse sort of Jackson Varney where we ban Russians from coming, it just is not, um, it's quite clearly not the solution. I'd, However, on the nature of the fact that we are here um, to for the for the for the fellows for the students, I don't want to take up too much um, too much time, and I would like to invite them to to start thinking of their questions. Um, at the very end as well, as is tradition, I'll pass over um, to Bob to to sort of to, to wrap up um, because obviously I. Can't. Being British in particular, I quite like tradition, um, so you should appreciate that having spent a long time in Britain, but. Um, I also just wanted to pick up on one other small point, which was about the economic reconstruction. As the fellows will know, we had a very interesting discussion yesterday um, with Ivan Krastyev and with um, Yulia Bizyanko and um, Aliona Klivko about the reconstruction of Ukraine. And um, I remember Ivan made an interesting point about how actually the European, um, the, the EU um, invested more money in the former Yugoslavia than was invested, um, you know, if we bring it up to date for, for, for relevant price times, um, than was invested by America during the Marshall Plan. And we can all kind of see how how well that investment has 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 or hasn't worked out um, in certain parts. So it's, it's another aspect to, to think about. Well, uh, the first thing I would say is that before you pack your bags and leave, and as soon after this session as possible, sit down with Anna. Anna has given more thought to this question than anyone else, and she knows what else is going on. I'm involved with a fair amount of it, all of it, all of what I'm familiar with, track two, uh, education, education exchanges, and the rest of it have been badly harmed by what's happened, by the war, uh, disrupted in a way that uh, none of us could have imagined, uh, and that uh, leaves us all very sad. Uh, I am still involved with two track two things that are underway, the Luxembourg Forum that deals with nuclear weapons uh, and the NATO-Russia dialogue that uh, Sergei Rogov and Alexei Gromyko with the European Leadership Network organized. Uh, and we're having meetings. But I must say that within those meetings, I think Olya, who's involved with a lot of this as well, Sergey, I know less well on that score, there's a lot of wheel spinning, uh, inability to really think of where one goes forward, and an awkwardness. There's a lot of walking on eggs when you are dealing with your Russian counterparts that uh, prevents real progress. At the educational level, uh, I'm co-director of a new master's joint master's program between Moscow State University and MGIMO. Uh, which is now largely suspended. The university consortium among six universities, Columbia, Harvard, Sciences Po, Oxford, Vushka, and MGIMO, uh, is now two-thirds of what it was. It's basically operating uh, with Oxford and Sciences Po and Columbia and Harvard, and, and the Russian universities are not part of it. One hopes that you can keep these things intact so that at some point this can be resuscitated in various ways. Uh, Bill Potter's exchange with MGIMO is uh, is is underway. I mean, you're in Monterey, so you know what's going on on that score. You just hope that somehow it can be maintained. 
a last comment. Uh, I have I, I, I didn't expect to make a concluding statement at this meeting. So the only thing I would do is a reflection and then an admonition. I, I, I'm not a young man, uh, and I've gone through two dramatic changes in history, uh, including what happened after 1991 and the collapse of the Soviet Union uh, and the hopes that it created for all of us and what we thought was now going to happen, the way the world would change, uh, and where we are today, which is uh, literally 180 degree difference from what we thought would happen and the circumstances. But remember what happened before 1991 and indeed before 1985. In 1982, 1983, with Andropov, uh, 1983 with the downing of KL-007, anybody who thought at that point uh, would have imagined what would happen post-1985 would have been an institutionalized. Think of how much the world changed from where we were fundamentally in 1982-83 to where we were literally five or six years later. Now, whether there's a Gorbachev somewhere within the Russian system, because that change occurred from above in a way that nobody believed could occur, I don't know. But don't rule out the possibility that there can be fundamental discontinuity. That's not unknown in Russian history. Despite uh, the extrapolation, negative and, uh, and unhappy, that we shared with you today. The extrapolation is very discouraging from, from, where we were, from where we are at the moment. But that leads then to the admonition. Uh, and it's linked to what I said about what, ling what lingers in terms of track two, the wheel spinning, uh, the short-sightedness, the narrow vision, the inability to uh, think long. Uh, it's for you now, the younger people, in this dramatic circumstance. First of all, appreciate how much the world has changed. Uh, and in a way that really is quite ugly, uh, it, your world has become vastly more ugly than it was before. This is not a change that's positive. But in these circumstances, it's really for you to try to transcend the limitations, the myopia, the inability of governments, policymakers, so-called experts, uh, your own academic uh, mentors uh, to do that. Uh, you're not responsible for policy today. Think about policy when you will be responsible for it and the world that you will be responsible for some point in the future. Start doing that now. Don't stay stuck where all the rest of us are. And good luck to all of you. Thank you, Thank you so much. Um, thank you so much for these comments, um, Bob. Um, thank you as well to, to you for speaking um, on this panel. And thank you, Olga. And thank you, Sergei. Um, very, very grateful. Um, it was a truly very fitting and and um, excellent um, lecture um, and, and way a discussion and, and way to finish this symposium. Even if, well, I suppose it's fitting because, of course, it was also very depressing. Um, so as, as as it should be, really, um, given given the times in which we are currently living. But thank you all so much. Goodbye. Thank you very much.